Arm Arena held its breath. What's Cody looking for? He almost looked like he was in a daze or a trance or something. Oh, yeah, he's... Cody's looking to the sky. My God, what's he doing? That is, no. is his oh. a soon heaven on its way to hell. He saw something bad can happen when you're this high up. You're out of control. He, he's letting his emotion carry him away here. Oh my God. Cage matches? Yeah, they work. How could they not work? Although in the modern day, pro wrestling has its fair share of detractors for a whole host of valid and equally ridiculous reasons, the world of spandex covered grappling and glamour still has a lot to offer which keeps fans like me of this spectacular mix of sports and entertainment coming back for more. Some fans continue to watch because they're attracted to a particular wrestler willing them on to success through defeat and trials of combat. Some prefer the over-the-top soap opera storylines and the interactions between some of entertainment's most exaggerated characters. Other fans watch wrestling for the athleticism and spectacle of seeing world-class athletes leaping from the top rope and slamming their opponents with precision and power. Then you have the small section of fans who enjoy pro wrestling on a much more visceral level. Fans who watch for the brutality of a feud ending battle. They watch to see two wrestlers who hate one another battle seemingly to the death in a blood-soaked bout for the ages. All of these types of fans of pro wrestling are entirely valid in their opinions and are justified in appreciating any number of these reasons and engaging with the sweaty world of grappling in any way they see fit. However, in today's fast-paced world of constant streaming and endless broadcasts, it can sometimes be a struggle for pro wrestling companies to deliver a product which can satisfy the needs of all these different types of audience. The moments when a wrestling company can combine fan favourite characters in storylines which lead to memorable and purposeful matches are some of the most engaging and entertaining in any form of media, in my opinion. And in WWE and the wider world of wrestling, so many of these moments where all elements have aligned in order to tell a captivating story have taken place inside one of the business's most brutal and unforgiving constructs, the steel cage. In this video, I want to discover the origins of the steel cage in pro wrestling and its evolution through 80 years of chicken wire fences and bright blue bars into what we see in the modern day of the Elimination Chamber in WWE and All Elite Wrestling's take on the War Games stipulation with their blood and guts match. I want to see why this match stipulation has been considered so important to the history of pro wrestling through some of the most memorable cage matches of all time, and hopefully through this video we'll see if there's a place in the modern day for the steel cage match and what the future may hold for this controversial construction. Some of the first recorded competitive fights happened within the simple confines of a chalk or sand circle, crudely strewn on the ground around the combatants. Ancient wall paintings found inside the caves of Mongolia depict images of nude combatants fighting whilst surrounded by a group of onlookers in the crowd. The paintings have been dated as far back as 9,000 years ago during the Neolithic period. In ancient Greece, wrestling matches were a key part of the ceremonial games, with prestigious combatants grappling it out on a squared mat or cordoned off area with a circle painted in chalk around them. Wrestling is perhaps the oldest and most universal of all sports. The wall paintings of Beni Hassan show that almost every hold or throw known to modern wrestlers was known to the Egyptians 2,500 years before our era. The popularity of wrestling among the Greeks 
is proved by the constant metaphors from this sport and by the frequency with which scenes from the wrestling ring appear not only in athletic literature and art, but also in mythological subjects. In China, records of sporting events from between 221 and 207 BC show public wrestling matches being displayed for the crowd's amusement. The bouts took place atop an elevated structure known as a Lei Tai. The second oldest book on Japanese wrestling, which was first released in the year 720, is called the Nino Shoki and outlines the events of the very first sumo bout, which is said to have taken place in 23 BC. At this point in time, the bouts were little more than unregulated punching and grappling contests, often with no rules, no referee and no real confines to contain the fighters. In 1578, Oda Nobunaga held an enormous 1,500 man sumo contest in his castle in Japan and needed a way to display several bouts at once in order to speed up the rounds of the competition. This is where the circular arenas were used in order to keep the fighters in and the fans out. This tradition continued in many forms around the world, most notably in Japan where beloved sumo wrestlers have continued to fight for pride in one of the country's most iconic athletic endeavours. This is where we derive the name for the modern combat ring and we see the evolution from a simple rope or sand barrier being refined, elevated and better protected in order to further limit the risk of interaction between fighters and fans. Another beloved form of combat to take place all around the world is boxing, where at this time no real rules or regulations are in place surrounding contests, with fighters using taped fists surrounded by a horde of betting fans who would often encroach on the arena and slow down the pace of the fight. In 1743, the London Prize Ring Rules were established which saw the fighters meeting in a small designated circle to begin the bout. In 1838, a 24 by 24 foot square ring was developed by the Pugilistic Society in London and is seen by many as the beginning of the evolution in today's modern boxing. The widely accepted rules at this time stated that the ring shall be 4 and 20 feet square, formed of 8 stakes and ropes, the latter extending in double lines, the uppermost line being 4 feet from the ground and the lower 2 feet from the ground that in the centre of the ring a mark be formed to be termed a scratch, and that at two opposite corners, as may be selected, spaces being closed by other marks sufficiently large for the reception of the seconds and bottle holders to be entitled the corners. The vast history of combat sports being displayed for crowds is long and storied. These key areas which I've alighted in this brief history are the clues as to where the term squared circle was commonly said to originate. 1937 was a simpler time in the world of professional wrestling, long before the age of the enormous Hell in a Cell, the utter brutality of the eight-man elimination chamber, or heaven forbid, the ridiculous Punjabi prison match. On June the 25th of 1937, one hot Atlanta night, rabid Georgian fans were shocked and enthralled by a true spectacle. The first place we can track records back to one of wrestling's most barbaric ways of settling a dispute. In the Library of Congress, the records of the Atlanta Journal newspaper show an innovative fight between two fierce men. Jack Bloomfield defeated Count Petro Rossi in a ring surrounded on all sides by six foot high chicken wire fencing, and so the cold, hard history of the steel cage match begins. The original idea being that there would be no escape from one another, leaving for only one option, a fight to the bitter end, with one clear winner undisputed in their triumph through such adversity. In September of 1942, John Catan defeated Ignacio Martinez in a six-foot steel cage as the match stipulation started to spread to the north. Canadian fans at the time reportedly jubilant with the chance to indulge in a more vicious form of their beloved pro wrestling. In February of 1954, in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada, 
Tony Angelo defeated Frank Marconi, the match type becoming popular, seeing the likes of whipper Billy Watson defeat Antonio Leone in another Canadian province of Vancouver. When the mid-50s rolled around, wrestling was changing, and so did the format for these types of matches. A sturdier connected cage started to become the preferred choice for surrounding the ring. Using higher, interconnected steel chain fencing, Some companies constructed the cage in a way to have a roof, some were just large enough to contain the ring, and some, as was the case in Memphis wrestling, opted for larger structures that allowed space around the ring, more akin to a Hell in a Cell match in WWE. Tito Montez was arguably the 1960s most dominant athlete inside of a cage, defeating Don Kent, Bearcat Wright, Don Arnold and Kurt Von Steger in the course of a decade. The fences became a thing of the past by the 70s, but the idea of the steel cage match started to be explored further, with Indian death matches taking place across the country, with the likes of Fritz von Erich making a name for himself in such contests. This structure often consisted of spiked fencing poles lined side by side around the ring. This is where the dreaded modern-day Punjabi prison match takes its inspiration from. He's 15, 22. At 245 pounds, 15, 25, 20 feet in the air landing on you. Why? You know, it's all fake, fake anyway, so it didn't hurt. The 80s began with an era-defining moment, when in October 1982, in a match against Don Morocco, inside of a steel cage in WWF, Jimmy Superfly Snooker earned his nickname. Mick Foley said, Jimmy Snooker created that moment for me, a moment that was about so much more than just an athletic dive from the top of a steel cage. It was professional wrestling as art, Foley recounted, having been present on that famed night. For the first time on television, a wrestler had ascended the metal sides of the cage and stood ten feet above the ring. The crowd gasped as Snooker postured and posed from his position aloft the cage. Before taking a giant leap and making wrestling history. Flying through the air to the cheers of the now astonished crowd, Jimmy Snooker landed on Don Morocco for the 1-2-3. This moment opened up a whole world of possibilities and laid the groundwork for the modern day steel cage match. Another key aspect of any modern era cage match is its propensity for violence. I mean, if you've paid for your seat and are seeing bitter rivals battle out inside of a barbed wire cage, chances are you're looking for something a little bit more graphic than your average one-on-one single match. Around this time in 1983, the King of Memphis, Jerry the King Lawler, was adding to his tally of memorable steel cage matches in his most iconic against a young macho man Randy Savage in December for the Southern Heavyweight Championship. And I'm looking over, and I'm in the locker room. This ain't going to be pretty. (laughs) This is not going to be pretty. In 1985, the steel cage underwent huge changes, both in the construction of the cage itself and the aesthetic. The excitement of climbing to the top of the cage and out to the floor or diving down onto your opponent caused a change in WWE's approach to steel cage matches in general. At WrestleMania 2 in 1985, King Kong Bundy faced off against Hulk Hogan for the WWE Championship inside the newly redesigned Blue Bar Cage. WWE at the time heavily favoured large men as their top heroes and villains. The much sturdier cage, which would allow the even sturdier King Kong Bundy at least a fighting chance of ascending it without complete catastrophic failure. As was necessary with WWE, changing the rules of the steel cage match to allow victory only when a combatant exited the cage, either by climbing over the top or through the door. Legendary wrestler and commentator Jesse Ventura explained on the night, This isn't exactly a normal steel cage, usually it's a cyclone fence, but in the case of King Kong Bundy, he's about 450 pounds, he needs a reinforced cage. Since WrestleMania 2, there has only ever been one other steel cage match in its original form at WWE's biggest show of the year. However, this didn't stop WWE from releasing a video game for the NES and Sega Master System, which saw every matchup 
taking place at WrestleMania inside of a steel cage. This much forgotten WWF WrestleMania steel cage challenge, which released in 1992, featured wrestling icons such as Hulk Hogan, Bret Hart, Shawn Michaels and The Undertaker in matchups consisting entirely of simple punches and kicks and basic slam moves amongst a few other things. The gameplay is repetitive and has not aged well and it doesn't seem as if the game was received especially well by either fans nor critics at the time. One thing that this video game does go to show is the widespread appeal of the steel cage and the fact that even if WWE were not going to be featuring the match type at WrestleMania as the title suggests, the wrestling giant still understood the marketing potential of those vicious looking bars and the fact that children would want to buy a game purely to experience their favourite grapplers inside of a steel cage. I know I certainly did. At this point, I'd like to take a moment to discuss the way in which a wrestler can win within the confines of a steel cage. A rule in wrestling, as is the case with so much in the world of the squared circle, which I'm sure I'll never fully understand. Stipulations such as I quit matches being added to cards, including Bruno San Martino forcing one combatant to lose the fight by exclaiming that they can no longer compete. However, this was extremely rare and only used at least early on in a small handful of matches. During this entire time, the only other ways to win in a steel cage match was to pin, submit or KO your opponent, leaving them unable to continue. It was a fitting way to enclose a feud in a cage which means that nobody can escape and that the score was guaranteed to be settled with one man standing victorious over his hated foe. Escape the cage a simple idea in theory, one that would surely lead to many a wrestler clambering up the side of the fencing with their opponent incapacitated over the top towards the glory of the crowd. And yes, seeing a man who is more than double my size show such athletic prowess and make it out of the cage can be a sight to behold. But as soon as you dig a little deeper and look into what this rule change meant for the feud at stake and the emotional impact of the match, we see that allowing a victory by escaping the cage completely undermines the entire point. Some have even simply left the cage by opening the door and walking out. No real struggle or dramatic climax. What happens next? Does the wrestler left in the ring just concede their loss to the opponent, agreeing they've been clearly beaten and bettered by a superior athlete because their opponent managed to sneak through the cell door? How does this change in stipulation add to the definitive nature of a steel cage match? Simply put, it doesn't. In some cases, these cage matches are a result of rivalries which have stretched over years, originally designed as the ultimate endpoint, but with the way in which WWE handles cage matches in the modern day in regard to allowing victories within these matches, I believe that the steel cage match has lost some of its power. A steel cage match in WWE feels no more definitive than any other special match type. Feuds which have featured a battle inside of a cage have often continued long after one of the wrestlers has exited the cell. I believe a way in which WWE could reinvigorate this stipulation is a straightforward one. Keep the doors locked and only allow for victories within the cell to come by pinfall, submission or knockout and allow for that feeling of Two enemies being trapped in together to settle the score. Come back to this once great match type. Just to clarify, escaping the cage is irrelevant. It doesn't count. It's not a part of the equation to determine a winner. A winner is determined in the AEW rules by pinfall or submission, as it should have been all along. The blue bar cage became the de facto used for steel cage matches for more than a decade from this point in WWF where some historic battles took place including Magnum TA's brutal victory against Tully Blanchard in an I Quit variant of the match in 1985, Hulk Hogan defeating Big Boss Man in 1989 at Saturday night's main event, The Ultimate Warrior battling against Rick Rude at SummerSlam to retain the World Heavyweight title, Bret Hart and Shawn Michaels fought in a technical and exhilarating match in New York City as well as a whole host of other memorable moments from within these thick blue bars. 
thick blue bars that obscure the view for anyone not in the cage. The thick blue bars that were so far apart, cheaters could easily pass through a weapon and interfere with the match. The same thick blue bars that brought about the most dramatic change to the rules of the steel cage match to date. In the 80s, NWA tried having two and three rings inside a single st- inside a single cage setup for a couple of pay-per-views and even a small number of times where NWA and later WCW swung wildly in their attempts to draw in fans with the fondly remembered War Games. Dusty Rhodes had the idea for the War Games cage design after watching classic action film Mad Max 3 Beyond Thunderdome. By 1991 and 92, WCW began to use the War Games cage, and in 1993, the match stipulation became an annual event, which traditionally took place at the full brawl pay-per-view. The match was as over-the-top and spectacular as you would expect, from not only the ridiculous nature of the cage's design, but also the top-level athletes who stepped between its doors. However, the structure never lived up to the same excitement of the films that inspired the design. Current fans of NXT will be more than familiar with the War Games match type. In his later life, the creator of the match, Dusty Rhodes, spent much of his time passing on his wealth of knowledge in the WWE developmental brand NXT. After Rhodes' passing, his most iconic idea has been immortalised, WWE revitalising the War Games structure at the now annual pay-per-view of the same name. So this is three cages, small one, bigger one, Biggest one. And you got to drop down from the small one one to the middle one. And then you got to drop down from the middle one to the bottom one. And then you have a decision. In 1988, WCW had started its first real push towards the evolution of the steel cage match, adapting a doomsday cage or Tower of Doom for Great American Bash. A step too far perhaps, WCW decided to stack cages on top of one another and have some of the industry's most iconic superstars climbing around like children on a jungle gym at the park. Two combatants start in the central bottom ring with all the rest of the competitors locked inside of the rings above. After a set amount of time, which was explained to be two minutes, one of the upper cage doors would be unlocked and allow for one of the teammates to enter the fight. In time, all doors are unlocked for the upper cages and it becomes a complete mess, with 10 men who had no experience in this newly created match type struggle to put on a spectacle beyond the ludicrous aesthetic of the cage setup itself. White knuckles clenched around the fencing, the wrestlers were clearly not confident in the skills of the cage's constructors as they tentatively bounced around three levels with fans in attendance unable to see a single thing that was happening and television cameras barely able to follow the nonsensical action. Uh, in terms of what I think, what I thought about it, I hated it. I fucking hated it. And I think as I go back and I look at some of these things, you know, there's a reason why it doesn't take a flaming fucking cage with, you know, wild orangutans and a fucking, you know, unicorn with dynamite stuck up his ass to make this thing interesting. There's no real buildup. There's no reason why we're having this fucking colossal, gigantic, you know, clusterfuck of a match. It's just, oh, let's have this huge cage match. It'll be spectacular. The American wrestling scene wasn't the only place to witness a revolution within still cage matches in the 90s. As with so much in the world of entertainment in 1994, Japanese wrestling was changing from a colourful and fun fueled show for children into something darker and much more violent. In Kawasaki, Japan, in front of 52,000 fans inside of the Kawasaki Stadium, Atsushi Anita faced off against Genichiro Tenryu in a match which saw both these Asian hardcore legends push to their limits. The promotion which put on the show, spearheaded by Anita, Frontier Martial Arts Wrestling, was aptly named. The company was truly at the forefront of what was thought possible and indeed morally acceptable within the confines of a wrestling ring. 
what became known as an explosive barbed wire steel cage match has a name which, even if you aren't a big fan of pro wrestling, surely would grab your attention. And for better or for worse, that is exactly what these two vicious men achieved in this groundbreaking contest. A moment which is now looked back upon as somewhat of a turning point for hardcore wrestling, the ring ropes were replaced with explosive barbed wire which would ignite upon contact from a fighter, the match being cited by the likes of Mick Foley in the West and is credited with bringing new levels of popularity to this kind of violence in America at the time. Back in the US and in 1994, WWE was sticking to their guns and were at the height of their child-friendly, neon-lit period. Far from the ideas of hardcore matches and barbed wire, the steel cage in WWE saw a classic match between brothers Bret and Owen Hart at SummerSlam in August. With the WWF title on the line in Chicago, the Hart brothers brought their feud to new levels through an incredibly well-told story which explored Brett's skill as the more successful sibling and Owen as the younger brother, desperate to escape Brett's shadow. The wrestling which took place was of the highest calibre on display anywhere in the world at that time. Two men who know each other's moves in and out allowed for fast-paced exchanges full of clever submission escapes and seamless reversals. Brett went on to win the match and retain the title, however both men deserve praise for showing that even though the wrestling world in 1994 was about to change forever, their form of pure wrestling skill mixed with well-told stories can stand the test of time. After all, this match is a 5 star classic in my opinion, with the WWF title on the line and it didn't even main event the show. What did? This did. Undertaker vs Undertaker in a match which most would be hard pressed to remember any of aside from the fact that it merely happened. I know which of the two matches I would rather rewatch in the modern day. However, back in 1994 fans wanted change. They were sick of the cartoonish presentation style within WWE at the time and pay-per-view buys and show attendance began to dwindle. The late 90s really were the wild west of modern day pro wrestling on television. WCW and WWF were competing in a winner takes all battle for supremacy on Monday nights. The two wrestling titans both airing their weekly main show at the same time as well as a whole host of performers quitting from one company and joining another. This led to a time of real innovation in wrestling, at a moment which, for better and for worse, changed the course of grappling history forever. One of these changes came in the way that two companies delivered their steel cage matches. WCW, known in part for its taste for the clinically insane stories and over-the-top match stipulations, brought in the advent of the doomed cage and returned the steel cage match to its roots. However, the cage design seemingly hampered the performer's ability to climb and dive within it and led to some fans at the time complaining that WCW's version of the steel cage lacked the excitement of the WWE's. In March of 1999 at Uncensored, Ric Flair defeated Hulk Hogan in a first blood barbed wire cage match for control of WCW. As WCW changed, WWE at the same time were heading towards more gritty realism with their approach to pro wrestling. They took this outlook one step further when yet again they adapted the design of their steel cage, this time completely reverting back to the more flexible wire fence designs of a bygone era, being heavily inspired by cages used across the world which predated WWE's use of the blue and black bars whilst also allowing for high-risk manoeuvres off of the steel beams which support the top of the cage but do not impair the audience's vision. The clever design of this structure allows some give when an athlete is thrown or slammed into the cage walls while also being stable enough to support even the heaviest of competitors who are brave enough to dare climb to the top of this now even taller and more imposing cage. In the years since, we've seen the cage evolve in an explosive amount of ways. We've had the infamous Kennel from Hell match, what was supposed to be a cage inside another, with aggressive guard dogs who would prevent the wrestlers from escaping. However, the reality on the night hit home hard when fans were treated to a barely visible fight inside of a naff-looking set of poorly constructed cages and nervous dogs shitting all around the ring out of fear. 
and shagging one another, as dogs tend to do. Oh, I love wrestling. I was legit. I was legit scared for for what you know what the results were going to be. This is a tough son of a gun, man. Most people don't get up from that. At WWE's Bad Blood in Your House in October 1997, the company decided to expand the size of the steel cage and add a roof. The match between Shawn Michaels and The Undertaker was dubbed Hell in a Cell and went down as an instant classic. Especially amongst fans watching on television, the larger cage meant the camera person could be inside of the structure between the ring and the cage perimeter, meaning a much easier and more clear watching experience without that pesky chainmail in the way. From around the world of wrestling, we have iconic moments such as when Mick Foley plunged from the top of the newly formed Hell in a Cell cage onto the announce table, or when Mick Foley was chokeslammed through the top of the cage and onto the ring far below. That's right, those two moments which saw Mick Foley suffer from numerous and severe injuries happened in the same match. The same match against The Undertaker that gave us some of Jim Ross's most iconic calls of the decade. If you have a chance to go back and watch it in its entirety, man, it's, it's, it still packs a wall up, right? It's heavy. Since its inception, there have been over 50 televised Hell in a Cell matches, with each contest bringing with it new and interesting ways in which a wrestler may harm an opponent, with help from the tons and tons of metal that surrounds them. The structure being bigger and allowing much more space between the ring and the outer structure lends itself to matches with more wrestlers inside of the cage. And as the Hell in a Cell stipulation brings with it a larger cage, it also has slightly revised rules to ones we see in the current steel cage match type. The big difference is that escaping the cell does not give victory to the escapee. The only ways to win the match are to pin, submit or incapacitate an opponent within the ring or atop the cell. This means that the problems that have arisen with steel cage matches and the acceptance that escaping the cage ensures a victory are not present in the Hell in a Cell match. The stipulation proved to be such a consistent draw for WWE that we now have a pay-per-view dedicated to hosting the monstrous cage every year. Some fans comment on how having a dedicated yearly event built around Hell in a Cell means that the storylines leading up to the event often feel forced and inorganically driven towards a match within the cell. If you know that the pay-per-view is coming up, then you know that in that month leading up to the event, there will be for certain at least one or two rivalries built around the idea that they will face off inside the confines of the menacing steel structure. However, some fans, myself included, believe that the Hell in a Cell match should serve as a way to end a long-running feud, one which has no other options after exhausting every other channel to decide a victor. A last resort, which is only used when the time is right, not the other way around, as we see in the current day of WWE. So it wasn't just the fact that he took those bumps. And then the one through the cage, one straight down through. I remember he had a tooth, well, the tooth had fell out and was in his nose. In 1999, the wrestling world had undergone a full metamorphosis. A change to the Attitude Era within WWE brought with it a huge dedicated fan base, the likes of which have since to be replicated. As the counterculture became mainstream, the larger viewership for WWE and WCW meant other promotions had a chance to flourish too. As hardcore wrestling in ECW exploded in popularity, close behind them were Combat Zone Wrestling, who, in an attempt to capture some more of this newly invigorated fan base, created one of the most wrestling-y constructs of all time, simply named the Cage of Death. A barbaric combination of a raggedy steel cage filled to the brim with violent and menacing weaponry, with all whom enter the cage being heavily encouraged by the fans to use them in horrific and often rather bizarre ways. Lobo defeated Justin Payne, to win the inaugural Cage of Death match and took the CZW Iron Man Championship in a memorable match which solidified this match type amongst pro wrestling's most die-hard crowds. The Cage of Death has since become a staple for CZW and continues to feature at their yearly Cage of Death show, with the last 
taking place in 2019. As the popularity of the more extreme side of pro wrestling emerged, fans were no longer satisfied with a simple steel cage match. Hell in a Cell was WWE's response, but seemingly that wasn't enough. WWE wanted more wrestlers to compete inside of the steel cage stipulation, more danger, more steel. Thus, this monstrosity of modern day entertainment was born. On the 19th of November at the Survivor Series in 2002, countless tons of steel beams, plexiglass and linked fencing were combined for the ultimate steel cage variant, the Elimination Chamber. A space equally impressive in its feat of engineering as it is ludicrous. Designed specifically to bring out the most action and thus the most fans at an event. Two men starting in the ring and four or six others pressed into reinforced pods. Each podded superstar being released into the match in a seemingly random order. Until all wrestlers have entered the ring and one combatant is left standing. The now annual Elimination Chamber event in WWE has changed slightly over the years since it's held numerous classic matches, but at its heart the core of the Elimination Chamber is the same as what the steel cage match has always been. Brutal, a little bit ridiculous, but always incredibly exciting. Since this time, Fighting within a designated area, confined by ropes or fences, has continued to prove popular amongst combat sport fans around the world. As society has evolved, so have our tastes and morals. These days, most people prefer their violence to come in some fictional form, on the silver screen, from a Marvel film perhaps. This type of violence is deemed safe for children and is widely accepted as family fun and natural. The idea of seeing two young men coming to blows is a familiar scene, which permeates all forms of popular entertainment media internationally. However, real life fights fall into a different category. At the top end of society, we see celebrities and famous faces paying small fortunes to be ring sites at the big Las Vegas boxing match. It's seen as morally acceptable for adults to enjoy a contest between two highly trained and consenting individuals. At the other end of society, there's a dark underbelly in the world of unlicensed fighting. A sordid place of unregulated combat, often with little rules and a lot of illegal betting. Over the years, pro wrestling has been influenced by, and has in turn influenced, all manner of different forms of entertainment. Thus, there's a whole manner of different film and television which can include references to elements of the pro wrestling world. The silhouette of this iconic structure speaks for itself. Those who have no idea about WWE or pro wrestling would find it easy to understand the types of combat which take place in such a steel cage. As far back as the 1975 film Hard Times, we see action hero Charles Bronson facing off against Robert Tessier inside of a caged area, a gritty battle with loads of hard-hitting blows. During the episode Fight or Die from the series Walker, Texas Ranger, we see titular Walker, played by Chuck Norris, facing off inside of a steel cage against pro wrestling icon Macho Man Randy Savage, who goes under the marvellous name of White Law Lundgren. There's an excellent fight scene which takes place in a fenced off area, Escape from New York, John Carpenter's masterful post-apocalyptic film starring Kurt Russell. The movie sees Snake Plissken forced to fight within a caged area, which reminds me somehow of Lucha Underground. It happens here! And it finishes here. Two men enter, one man leaves. Welcome to another edition of Thunderdome! In Mad Max Beyond Thunderdome, two men enter, one man leaves, has a title which lets you know you're in for some serious dome-related antics. WWE presented their weekly programming live from their version of the Thunderdome during the entire 2020 pandemic, with fans now coining that whole period as the Thunderdome era. WCW had a cage heavily inspired by the third instalment of the Mad Max franchise. The film sees titular Max, played by Mel Gibson, facing off against the blaster in a fight to the death inside this now iconic structure. Rick and Morty even did a parody. Well, as my father used to say, if you can't stand the heat, stay out of the kitchen. 
The original live-action Incredible Hulk, Lou Ferrigno, put his bulging biceps into action when he starred in a film simply titled Cage, which featured a cage-fighting competition which feels somewhere between modern-day UFC and old-school WWF still cage matches. In 1994, Lou Ferrigno starred in the sequel Cage 2 and faced off in an intergender matchup on the Cage cable network. You better fight like you mean it! She's not kidding, get ready for a bloodbath! <gasps> References to still cages in pop culture do not end there, however. In the 2D world of anime, we've seen a cage match between some hapless teenage girls and some mascots in the much beloved series Amagi Brilliant Park. Pokemon's Detective Pikachu, voiced by Ryan Reynolds, has a battle depicting the titular tiny electrical mouse facing off against childhood favourite Charizard inside of a large fenced-off arena. When the worlds of WWE and Scooby-Doo collided, we were presented with the classic cartoon WrestleMania mystery, in which we see John Cena, Kane and Sin Cara facing off against legendary opponent Ghost Bear inside of a steel cage. In another officially licensed WWE spin-off, we see a child entering into the world of pro wrestling under the moniker Kid Chaos. In the film Main Event, created in partnership with Netflix, we see our main character facing off inside four sides of steel. That wasn't part of the deal, Flair. Hey, it's Vader time, and he's gonna tear you apart. Then he's gonna take that championship belt, big man, and that's gonna hurt you more than anything. Woo! When WCW entered into a partnership with popular television show Baywatch, we got a chance to see Ric Flair face off against Macho Man Randy Savage before the main event. Hulk Hogan faced off against legendary big man Vader inside a steel cage in one of the nicest locations I've ever seen for a pro wrestling match. Fitting with the nature of the Baywatch television show, the ring is right next to the beach with the fans and the shoreline surrounding the ring. Police Story Lockdown, starring Jackie Chan, shows us a brutal fight inside of a caged area. The first time we see Wolverine, played by Hugh Jackman in the X-Men movie franchise, the director decides to show us the fan-favourite comic character embroiled in a violent fight inside of a steel cage. The battle is a way of showing the audience Wolverine's physical power and fighting ability, but also, with the scene taking place inside of the cage, allows the film's creators to show the dark and gritty side of Wolverine. In another mutant movie, we see a fight inside of a cage. During the film X-Men Apocalypse, we see Nightcrawler being forced to fight for his life inside of a huge electrified structure against fellow mutant Archangel. Possibly the most memorable and my favourite instance of a steel cage match being shown in a film or on television holds a special place in my heart. As a kid, watching Sam Raimi's Spider-Man film, I was so excited when I saw the reveal of the wrestling match for the first time. It's clear to see that the team behind the movie have a soft spot for pro wrestling themselves and went above and beyond to feature so many subtle nods to the wrestling business. Peter Parker's homemade wrestling gear is adorable and not far off what you'll see if you watch some of the backyard wrestling on YouTube. The announcers give Peter the now famous Spider-Man moniker as his ring name. The terrifying, the deadly, the amazing Spider-Man! My name's the Human Spider. And the ladies try to get a pre-match interview. Yeah, they're exaggerated, sure, but the feeling's the same. The film perfectly encapsulates a certain type of the most over-the-top form of this beloved sport and does so with a glint in its eye and a tongue firmly in its cheek. As we see Bonesaw easily dispatch of his previous challenger, Bonesaw is really... Peter Parker enters the ring. He realises now he's trapped inside a lowering cage against a man who cannot stop appearing in pro wrestling spin-offs which feature a steel cage, Macho Man Randy Savage again. This time at the end of his career where you can clearly see the tortuous veins and bulging muscles have reached critical mass for the Macho Man. Spidey uses his agility and newfound spider skills to evade the attack from Bonesaw 
using the steel cage to gain elevation from his aggressor. To even the score, Bonesaw is chucked a chair, which he proceeds to batter Spider-Man over the head with before slamming the human spider into the walls of the cage. Before Bonesaw can finish his opponent, Spidey delivers swift kicks, followed by a monkey flip, which lands Bonesaw on his head and manages to survive inside one of cinema's greatest uses of a steel cage. In 2002, Ring of Honor were a young wrestling promotion with a big heart and a desire to prove themselves. In an attempt to highlight the skills of their younger, more athletic and high-flying roster, the company officials created a variant on the steel cage match which would go on to be known as the scramble cage. Wooden platforms were placed atop the corners of the steel cage so as to support the performers better and give a greater area for the wrestlers to climb up and show off their daredevil antics. A small change to the formula which proved to be popular amongst fans but less so amongst performers who have said that they felt a pressure to perform death defying stunts off of the scramble cage as that's what the fans had come to expect when they saw those big elevated wooden platforms. Whilst most wrestling companies choose the traditional four-sided ring for their shows, some have made a name for themselves using six sides of rope, such as TNA, now Impact Wrestling. Impact used the distinct six-sided ring through its arguably hottest run, coming before the company reverted to the four sides in 2010. There was always much debate, a hot topic for discussion, which has continued amongst wrestling statisticians and performers alike. Where do I start? Um, and obviously I didn't come up with it, saw it in Mexico. But when you are in different television meetings, uh, specifically where, when you're in uh, uh, toy vendors uh, and really the overall licensing program, uh, battling, not battling, but you know what makes you stand out from WWE? I, I, I can never, I'll never forget it. And I thought to myself, if I could get, you know, Sting wasn't a fan of it. Um, Hulk wasn't a fan of it. Uh, th there's, there's multiple guys. If they were in the meetings, uh, you, you sitting in a, a meeting and they say, oh, you got a six sided ring. You got instant shelf space. That, that's a game changer in adding zeros to the bottom line. No true consensus has ever been reached about the success of the six sided ring. Some speak of the ring's unique appeal, its very nature, to be contrasting to most every other promotion around the world, an encapsulation of Impact's desire to break the mold. When they changed the um, six-sided ring to the four-sided ring, and, and, and I heard it was being debated, and I was like, me personally, I didn't agree with it because there again, I really truly believed in the identity that TNA had built that was different different than any other wrestling company that had ever been produced and uh, having a six sided ring, it was just different. Um, and the thing is, did I like the six sided ring? <laughs> Not really. It wasn't my cup of tea. Whilst other traditionalists speak of the awkwardness of performing in an unusually shaped ring, most wrestlers train for years inside of four sides and making the change just didn't come naturally to everyone, which I must say, I can completely appreciate. It's not simply the number of sides that are changed for this special ring. The ropes are shorter, which can impact the springiness, as well as the angles being completely off for when rebounding across the ring, making it possibly disorientating when acting upon instinct, as so many of the vastly experienced athletes do today. There's a reason the four-sided ring is used by 99.9% .9 of all wrestling companies around the world, after all. TNA fans, you asked for it, so here it is, the six-sided ring. Impact Wrestling even gave the six-sided ring a second run out from 2014 to 2018, a moment which was yet again received with a mixed reception from fans and wrestlers within the grappling world. AAA Lucha Libre in Mexico is also known for whipping out the hexagonal bad boy for special events and the six-sided ring itself is said to have originated in Mexico where multi-man matches and high-flying action lends itself well to the use of a construct with more posts and more spots for the athletes to climb and inevitably leap from. 
because hell, I'm a wrestler. I, I, I know how to bounce off ropes uh, or, or thought, thought I did. So working in a four-sided ring versus six-sided ring, if you've got a problem with that, grow up. Thus, when it came time in 2004 for TNA to create its very own version of the steel cage for the Turning Point pay-per-view, the construction needed to fit the abnormally sided ring. The lethal lockdown stage, six sides of steel, were constructed to confine the match between America's Most Wanted and Triple X, which was set to see the losing faction disbanded. As the tag teams doubled up in a blood-soaked affair, the most memorable moment of the match came when Elix Skipper made his way atop the hexagonal cage and the gasps of the audience leapt through the air in a display in which he showed no fear, only a determination to stun and entertain the fans. TNA's Jeff Jarrett famously borrowed the idea of the company's infamous six-sided ring from Mexico, but what you may not remember is the Steel Asylum, a cage match designed in direct response to AAA's Dome of Death. Also referred to as the Terror Dome, TNA used this bright red monstrosity to house several excellent X-Division matches with luminous rouge bars and a shape which is almost exactly taken from their Mexican counterparts. The main issue with this type of cage is visibility, with the holes in the bars being relatively small and the bright contrast making it hard for your eyes to focus on camera shots taken from outside of the ring. In Mexico in 2007, AAA pushed the creation of the WCW-styled cage, known as the Thunderdome, further and designed a battle arena referred to as Domo de la Muerte or Dome of Death for their Triple Mania 15 show of the year. The dome has proven to be extremely popular in the years since, with many Mexican lucha legends facing off inside of its globed construct. The matches which take place inside of the Domo de la Muerte are often accompanied by hordes of weapons such as a 15-foot ladder or a flaming table or two. Well, there you see it, folks. Six tons is a 26 feet by 26 feet, 20 feet tall. In 2021, the octagon of UFC is the world's most popular fighting cage, with millions of combat fans regularly tuning in to see the most modern iteration of a pastime which predates writing. The Ultimate Fighting Championship has brought high-level combat to a new generation and since the 90s has steadily become increasingly mainstream. A part of UFC's success is its characters, the personas of athletes such as Conor McGregor who have made hundreds of millions of dollars with his combination of fighting technique and the ability on the microphone, something which can be said is the same for most stars in the world of pro wrestling. Fighters in the UFC walk to the ring to the sound of their theme song, a battle cry similar to that which has been used in WWE for decades. We see the popularity of MMA feeding back into pro wrestling with the likes of WWE's recent attempts at an underground fighting league which was explained to be the future of more mature WWE programming bringing realistic and hard hitting combat in a more unscripted and unregulated approach for its older fans. However, in reality, what we saw was a sweaty Shane McMahon attempting to bring 1990s sleaze and fights which fell completely flat with a whole host of wrestling fans before the entire idea was scrapped. The unforgiving nature of the metal structure itself has a presence to it. As soon as the enormous steel construction surrounds the wrestlers, you get a real sense that something special is about to happen. Before the bell has even rung, just the visuals alone are enough to perk up my attention. And perhaps through the use of some rules I don't agree with, or the oversaturation of cage matches in pro wrestling in general, fans aren't as excited when those gigantic steel walls begin to descend and enclose the ring as they were back when the steel cage match was always the end point to a notable bloody feud. However, to me, there will always be a place in the wrestling world for creative and innovative performers to evolve the very construction of the steel cage and in turn the action which we as the fans are so lucky to witness within it.
Thanks for watching. We're off the air.